Reviews for Netflix's new film Outside the Wire are in, and well, they could be a bit better. Maybe most people are like me and have trouble focusing on the story when we have scenes of Harp referring to Anthony Mackie's Leo as Cap. Yes, I know that. What other fun Easter eggs, huge plot holes, and interesting trivia tidbits can be said about this movie? Well, let's remove our fail-safe devices and dive right in. Does time work differently in the future? I mean, it has to, or else Outside the Wire has a pretty major plot hole early on. We're told that Harp has 56,000 flight hours logged, which sounds pretty impressive, right? 56,000 flight hours. Well, it should, because if you actually map that out, that means he would have had to log 8 hours almost every single day for 19 years. Yeah, I know Harp was dedicated, but I don't see him practicing his drone skills when he was like 10, do you? And no one wanted to check on this at any point? Do you think the other robots look at Leo and get a little jealous? I mean, they glance at Leo and see a robot that gets to look like Anthony Mackie, while they have to look like lawn mowers with guns. And it's not like they get the same level of respect, either. All the soldiers in the movie call the robots Gumps, which has to be a reference to Forrest Gump. And sure, Forrest Gump was lovable and could do almost anything he was asked. If you call someone Gump, it's not exactly a term of endearment. That, that's just perfect. But then again, Gump did make an excellent soldier, which these robots needed to be, so maybe it wasn't all bad. Did you recognize Pilo Asbake from Game of Thrones in Outside the Wire? I know he wasn't playing a vulgar rock and roll pirate in this, so you're forgiven if you couldn't quite place him. That's right, Pilo played Euron Greyjoy in the hit fantasy show as well as the evil Victor Koval here. Both characters ended up meeting grisly fates, so Pilo is earning quite a reputation as a go-to villain. But there were some interesting things about Koval especially his symbol, which more or less looked like a decked out V. But this symbol didn't more than just serve as a cool design. It actually foreshadowed whenever Koval's forces were about to attack. Every time our heroes were out in the open, if this V showed up on a wall or something, chances are a firefight was imminent. It's on the wall before their motorcade is attacked, it's on the shelter as they're dropping off the vaccine, you get the picture. Leo says in the movie he looks like how he does because of PSYOPs, which is a real technique the military has used to help fight wars over the years. In World War I, over 50 million leaflets were dropped using artillery shells that would help decimate German morale. In World War II, radio stations were established specifically to target enemy soldiers who were listening, and nowadays, there are specific PSYOP soldiers who are deployed around the world to help with psychological warfare. Cool. It's truly fascinating. Hey, if you need to shoot your movie at a sinister power plant, there's one place that should be at the top of your list. The Kellenfold Power Station was a major shooting location for this movie, and you might have recognized it from other places too. Chernobyl Diaries, Strike Back, Spy, and Berlin Station, among other projects, all filmed here as well. It's located in Budapest, Hungary, so if you're ever in the neighborhood and feel power planty, go ahead and stop by. Anthony Mackie is clearly a recognizable name at this point thanks to his tenure as Captain America's second best sidekick, but the real star of this movie is Damson Idris, who holds his own with Mackie and has to navigate this crazy robotic world. Idris may not be a household name quite yet, but he's certainly on his way. He's best known now for that one episode of Black Mirror that also starred Hot Priest from Fleabag and America's sweetheart Topher Grace, but also for starring on the FX show Snowfall, which if you haven't seen, Put it on your watch list right now. We mainly were introduced to the Gumps as soldiers in the film, but it's clear not all robots are soldiers. When Harp is first deployed, we get to see robot dogs also roaming the camp. That's right, man's best friend has been mechanized. Do you think they sell these robot dogs back home in this world? And if this world has robot dogs, does that mean it also has robot cats? These are the questions I need answered. This might be the future where robots walk among us, but it's not that far away. Did you catch that the movie takes place in 2036? The 15 year difference is both short enough to give us a brave new world that's familiar, and more or less operates the same, but also long enough to have these robots fully integrated into warfare and generally accepted. Though if we start right now on building robots like Leo, do you think we'd be done in just 15 years? That seems like a lot of work. But then again, at 15 years ago, some of the tech we have today would seem impossible. 
When we first meet Leo, we're led to believe he's your everyday human being. You know, standard flesh and blood and all those gooey human insides. Obviously, he's much more than that. But did you catch the song that he was listening to in his first scene? The song was Stars Fell on Alabama by Ella Fitzgerald and Louis Armstrong. And the story behind that song is fascinating as it deals with an actual meteor shower that really happened in Alabama. Overall, Leo has great taste for a robot. Were you left questioning just what Leo wanted at the end of the movie? He seems pretty genuine in his confession that all of this was just so the world would stop making more of him, but as Harp said, all he's done in the movie up to this point is lie and manipulate situations to his advantage. Could this have been a last chance Hail Mary or perhaps some protocol embedded within his system? Honestly, probably not. I think after watching him struggle with his existence for the whole movie, this was one time Leo was 100% telling the truth. Yeah, Leo is an enhanced individual whose fighting skills would leave you in the hospital breathing through a straw before you can say the word robot, but it doesn't mean he gets to have all the fun by himself. Leo's contact, Sophia, probably gets the best action takedown of the entire movie when she somehow disarms that baddie with just her coat. How do you get good at using a coat for a weapon? Damn! Is that a special certification or does that just come naturally? Is it possible to obtain this power? You heard a lot of jargon and codes being thrown around outside the wire, but perhaps the most interesting is Sistema Perimeter. Sistema Perimeter. That's Russia's automated nuclear retaliation system. That's actually a very scary thought when you think about it, but what's even more gulp-inducing is the fact that this is actually based on a real thing. There's plenty of speculation and rumors that Perimeter is indeed still a thing in today's world, and it's been carried over to the post-Soviet Russian Federation. So if you're ever in the area, keep an eye out, okay? Picking a movie title is like 90% of the movie. You need something catchy if you want people to watch it, especially in this streaming era where a new movie is released every six seconds. So the title is vital, and it's gotta make some sense. Which begs the question, is outside the wire really a phrase? Why, yes it is. It's a true term that refers to being outside the fence and confines of a secured facility like a military base. So yeah, the title totally fits what's happening. I mean, they rejected my suggested title, My Best Friend the Robot, but yeah, I guess outside the wire works too. You might have heard characters talking about running the gauntlet during the movie, but if you're not caught up on your ancient history, that phrase might have gone right over your head. But the context of such a phrase is actually pretty brutal. Nowadays, it's defined as to go through a dangerous crowd of people or other clusters of items in order to reach a certain goal. But historically, running the gauntlet was a form of military punishment, where soldiers had to run between two rows of men with sticks who would do their best to deal some painful attacks. Oh, 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 oh. Ouch. I know the movie wanted to be like Training Day meets The Terminator, which would have been flat out amazing, but what we got is unfortunately a movie that veers closer to something like Neil Blomkamp's Chappie or even Elysium, both of which are fine-ish, but probably not the best movies you want to be compared to. The look and feel of this movie definitely feels like it's set in the same world as Chappie, and I'm not sure how intentional that is or not. A lot of reviewers have picked up on the Chappie comparisons, so let's say something positive. If you really like this movie, you should probably go watch Chappie next, right? Alright, what came first, the chicken or the egg? That's the kind of question I have after seeing all the gummy bear references in the movie. We know that Harp's fiancée Olivia has a cute nickname for him, which is Gummy Bear. And although it's never actually explained in the film how someone like Harp got such an adorable nickname, it's pretty clear from the opening scene. Our first introduction to the cold, emotionally empty drone pilot is him surveying a situation while calmly munching on a bag of gummy bears. Anthony Mackie just plays such a great soldier, doesn't he? Well, he should at this point because he's played so many of them. One of Mackie's big breaks was as Sergeant J.T. Sanborn in Best Picture winner The Hurt Locker, and it wouldn't be the last time he played a military man. He also has experience playing more robotish sci-fi roles, with his taking over as the lead character in Altered Carbon Season 2. And now we've hit the apex of his career where he's playing both a robot soldier. Talk about moving up in the world, right? 
When you're looking to compose a war film, you probably want to get a composer who has a history with that sort of thing. So it's no surprise that the movie went to Lorne Balfe to craft the music for the film. The Scottish composer has a long history in Hollywood scoring war, action, and science fiction films, with some of his biggest recent films including 13 Hours, The Secret Soldiers of Benghazi, Terminator Genesis, and Mission Impossible Fallout. I'm actually a little surprised the movie didn't lean into the horror elements of a rogue robot soldier, given its director. Mikhail Hafstrom has plenty of experience directing horror and thriller movies like 1408, The Right, Evil, but then again, Hafstrom has been moving away from his horror roots in recent years, directing things like Sylvester Stallone's action flick Escape Plan and multiple episodes of TV's Bloodline. What do you think? Do you like the direction of it, or should Hafstrom maybe get back to directing horror movies? This is one of those sci-fi movies that's just begging for a sequel, right? Sure, Leo was destroyed, but we don't know if his mission was ultimately successful. Did the world learn their lesson about building advanced robots to fight wars? My guess is no, and I would love to see a new version of Leo up and running and outside the wire too, wouldn't you? Hey, maybe it would be a little better than this one. Just saying. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs>